Today is day 361 of the October 7th war, a war that Hamas started from Gaza, Hezbollah joined the next day from Lebanon, and now involves the Islamic Republic of Iran and its proxy armies on a total of seven fronts around Israel. Hezbollah's war against Israel has entered a new phase as Israel takes action to return displaced families to their homes. For a whole year, Israel has warned Iran's proxy army in Lebanon, back off or we will have to push you away. Hezbollah did not back off. Now Israel is pushing it away. Last night, the IDF began limited, localized, and targeted ground raids based on precise intelligence against Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon. These Hezbollah targets are located in villages close to the border with Israel. They pose an immediate threat to Israeli communities in northern Israel. One reason that these areas pose an immediate threat to our people is because the Hezbollah Army of Terror has been attacking Israelis from these areas for the past year, since October 8th. Hezbollah hasn't stopped, firing over 9,000 rockets, guided anti-tank missiles, and suicide drones into Israeli cities and towns for 12 months. The distance between Hezbollah and Israeli families is very short. There's another threat from Hezbollah that the whole world needs to understand. Hezbollah planned to use villages in Lebanon along the border with Israel as launch points for an October 7th style massacre. Hamas stole Hezbollah's idea. Hezbollah had a plan to invade Israel, conquer parts of the Galilee region, and massacre countless Israelis. Hezbollah still dreams of doing what Hamas did on October 7th. Israel will not allow Hezbollah to carry out its vision. Every day Iran's proxy army still sits on Israel's northern border is on October 6th. What happened on October 7th from Gaza can never happen again, anywhere. There is one main goal of Israeli military operations in Lebanon, to allow the 60,000 residents of northern Israel, who fled their homes last October and have been homeless for the last year, to return to their homes safely without the fear that Hezbollah will shoot them, or worse. Now, in order for Israelis to feel safe in their homes, Hezbollah must not only stop shooting rockets, it must back off. It was warned for the past year that it needed to back off. Hezbollah has not backed off. And that is why the Israel Defense Forces are currently pushing Hezbollah away. Today, Hezbollah fired rockets at central Israel, Sirens sounded here in Tel Aviv. One of the rockets struck a highway next to a village in Israel called Kafar Qasim. It's a Muslim Arab village. Hezbollah tries to kill Jews and it hits Muslims. It doesn't care. Hezbollah doesn't care at all for human life, not Israeli human life and not Lebanese human life. Two people were wounded in the attack and are receiving treatment. Here's the good news. The United States supports Israel's operation in Lebanon to push Hezbollah away from the Israeli border. You heard that right. The US is behind us. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said it was necessary to dismantle Hamas's attack infrastructure, Hezbollah's attack infrastructure along the border in order to ensure that Hezbollah cannot conduct October 7th style attacks on Israel's northern communities. Austin also said a diplomatic resolution is required to ensure residents of northern Israel can return safely to their homes. Of course, nobody wants a diplomatic resolution more than Israel. We don't want to have to send our friends to fight in the north. The question is how? Hezbollah has been attacking the people of Israel for an entire year. What deal is on the table? A return to the past is unacceptable. Israel will not allow a ceasefire that allows an armed and dangerous terrorist army to mobilize on any Israeli border, whether in Gaza or in Lebanon. Not going to happen anymore. We've been here before. 18 years ago, the Second Lebanon War ended with the UN Security Council Resolution, 1701, that ordered Hezbollah to disarm and move north of the Litani River. That resolution was never enforced. Israel is demanding a diplomatic solution that will see Hezbollah removed from the border and disarmed, just like that UN resolution was meant to do 18 years ago. 
it's time for the government of Lebanon to take responsibility for the future of Lebanon. Disarm the Iranian proxy army that operates on its soil and make peace with Israel. Yes, a ceasefire is not enough. We should demand peace. The entire international community, the United Nations, European Union, United States, the UK, France, everyone who cares or says they care about what is happening in Lebanon need to make their voices heard and demand nothing less than normal, peaceful, open relations between Israel and Lebanon. Because this is not a war against Lebanon or its people, it is a war against Hezbollah, the Iranian proxy army that has taken over their country. And Israel is now giving the Lebanese people an opportunity to take their country back. We cannot afford to miss this opportunity. Finally, it may feel like Israel is alone, but it's not true. We have friends. In the United Kingdom, aspiring leaders of the Conservative Party are expressing very supportive messages. Kemi Bedenok is one of them. She said Israel should be congratulated for eliminating Hezbollah warlord Hassan Nasrallah. She praised Israel's targeted strike as extraordinary. Robert Jenrick wore a hoodie that said Hamas are terrorists. He even said the Star of David should be displayed at every point of entry to the UK to show that the UK stands with Israel. Another candidate, Tom Dug Tugendhat, said that Hezbollah is evil and vile and that he supports Israel's right to target Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon. James Cleverly, a former foreign secretary who came to visit right after October 7th, was asked if he supports Israel's ground operation in Lebanon, and he said, I do. What does all this indicate? It indicates a significant portion of the British public expects their leaders to stand with their ally, Israel, fighting on the front lines against the same enemies as the United Kingdom. It also indicates that our messages have an audience. We must keep speaking the truth, sharing the facts, refuting the lies, and standing up, what's, standing up for what is right, because we cannot expect anyone to stand up more loudly for us than we are willing to stand up for ourselves. Israel is on the front lines of humanity, fighting for humanity, fighting against the same terrorist enemies, threatening the whole of the West and the whole free world. And they need us to stand up for ourselves in order to help them stand up for themselves. We'll now take some questions from our audience watching live on social media. Elon, you referenced the statement of Secretary of Defense Austin. Naomi is watching on our live screen and she's asking, didn't Biden call yesterday for a ceasefire? How do you explain the messages from the United States and interpret them? Sometimes world leaders do not say in public what they say in private. In fact, Politico published just this morning that in private, US officials have been supportive of Israel's ground operation, even as President Biden calls for a ceasefire. Why? Well, they were hoping to get to a diplomatic resolution. We'd like to get to a diplomatic resolution, one that actually does what the last diplomatic resolution was meant to do. But they thought that that would happen if it was possible to reach a ceasefire in Gaza. Reach a ceasefire in Gaza, you'll reach a ceasefire in Lebanon. But then the US realized Hamas isn't interested in a ceasefire in Gaza. And that means that there's no way to get a ceasefire in Lebanon right now. And so according to Politico, US officials support Israel's ground operation as a way of putting pressure on Hezbollah to get it to agree to a diplomatic resolution. None of us want war. We don't want to go into Lebanon. We don't want to send our friends, whether they're in the regular army or reserves up in the north, to fight. It's dangerous, people will get hurt and people will get killed. We need a diplomatic resolution. But here's our question for people who are calling for a diplomatic resolution now. How will it look any different from Resolution 1701, which ended the Second Lebanon War and was never enforced? It was meant to disarm Hezbollah. It was meant to push it north of the Litani River. That never happened, not in 18 years. UNIFIL did nothing. The Security Council did nothing. The government of Lebanon did nothing. How will it be different from Resolution 1701? And why do you think that this one will be enforced when the last one wasn't? Unfortunately, the only thing that Hezbollah will respond to is force. And in the last few weeks, Israel has been degrading Hezbollah's capabilities at a dizzying scale. You'll be on top of what's been happening if you've been following these briefings of the citizen spokesperson's office. The entire leadership 
of Hezbollah has been killed. The entire command structure has been destroyed. There was the pager attack that many have attributed to Israel, which would be not only the most precise military strike in human history, but the most precise strike in military future, because no one is ever going to pull off something on the same level of science fiction, making thousands of pages explode simultaneously in terrorist faces. Israel has destroyed tens of thousands of Hezbollah rockets pointed at Israel, massively degraded its capabilities. We need a diplomatic resolution, but one in which Hezbollah is not armed and is not positioning those arms right on Israel's northern border. Elon, I'd like to follow up on a point that you made regarding UNIFIL. UNIFIL, that is the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, has tweeted a thread and they wrote that any crossing into Lebanon is a violation of Lebanese sovereignty and territorial integrity and a violation of Resolution 1701. Is Israel violating a UN resolution in this regard? What's a res you, you know what's a violation of Resolution 1701? Hezbollah is still being present in southern Lebanon. You know what's a violation of 1701? Hezbollah still having arms in southern Lebanon. Resolution 1701 ended the Second Lebanon War. It said Israel should get out of southern Lebanon. Yes, under the resolution, Israel should not be in southern Lebanon. It also said that Hezbollah has got to clear away, be disarmed, have no weapons south of the Litani River on Israel's border. For 18 years, it wasn't enforced. And UNIFIL didn't enforce it. It was used as human shields by Hezbollah that fired sometimes from just meters away from UNIFIL positions. And so Israel is saying now, if the world is not going to enforce Resolution 1701, if the government of Lebanon is not going to enforce Resolution 1701, then we will. Israel doesn't want to stay in southern Lebanon, God forbid. We're quite happy with the northern border where it is now. But we cannot have Hezbollah sitting on that northern border. And so as a result of the complete failure of the international security architecture, that was meant to keep us safe without a direct confrontation with Hezbollah, Israel is now forced to take action in its own hands and do the world's dirty work for it that no one else wants to do to keep us and the rest of the Middle East safe. This is a question from someone watching on our YouTube live stream. With the decimating of Hezbollah's top operatives, do you feel that Hamas feels a bigger uh, urgency to release the hostages? What is the situation in Gaza with the hostages? We aren't hearing a lot about it these days. I imagine that Hassan Nasrallah is sitting somewhere down in hell with his whole senior command looking up and thinking, oops, sorry, we shouldn't have declared war on Israel on October 8th. It was a mistake. It was a mistake to go to war to try to save Hamas's rapists and baby snatchers on October 7th. And I imagine that Yihya Sinwa, somewhere in a tunnel, probably under a UN school, is watching the news and having the same thought. Maybe I should release the hostages. There are still 101 hostages trapped in Gaza. We don't know how many are still alive. They're being starved and tortured and raped and executed. Time isn't running out. Time has already run out for them. We need to bring all the hostages home, the living, for rehabilitation, the dead for burial so their families can have closure, and in order to do that, we need to hear the world making a demand it hasn't made. To Hamas and its backers, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran, let them go now. We need the world to be putting pressure on the Hamas terrorist army to release the hostages and using their leverage on Hamas's supporters, the countries that are backing it, to force them to release the hostages. Hamas when this war ends, needs to understand it was a terrible mistake to wage it, just as I'm sure Hassan Nasrallah realizes from down there in the bowels of hell. Elon, this is your first daily briefing that you have done since you debated Mehdi Hassan in New York. How do you think that debate went, and why did you do it in the first place? Last week, I debated Hamas's top propagandist, Al Jazeera's Mehdi Hassan in New York. I'll tell you the truth, when the invitation came through, I resisted it. I didn't want to. It sounded about as enjoyable as root canal surgery without an anesthetic. But I said I have no choice. One, I want to put there on the debate stage the case for Israel's actions in this war. A war we didn't start, a war we didn't want, a war we didn't expect, a war in which Israel has been forced to make impossible choices. Choices that the defense attorney for Hamas will never acknowledge to try to keep its civilians safe. But there was another reason. 
I've spent the whole last year meeting Jewish students around the world and telling them, you are not just Gen Z, you are Gen Zionist, and Gen Zionists stand up to bullies. You need to stand up, you need to speak up, and if you don't stand up for yourself, no one is going to stand up for you. And I felt that if I chickened out of a debate with a bully, and he is a bully, he's a really nasty individual, then I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror or look those Jewish students in the eye and tell them, if Israelis my age are on the battlefield fighting Hamas terrorists, and if I'm on the debate stage debating Hamas's propagandist, then you can cross that encampment on campus and face down the Hamas fangirls. This is a war on all of us. October 7th was the opening shot not only of Hamas's attack, not only of Iran's regional war on seven fronts, but of a global war on the Jews. And we need Jews around the world to stand up and be counted and be unapologetic, and to understand that Israel advocacy is a Jewish safety issue because we cannot allow the lies that are being told about Israel to go unchecked and to think that life will continue as normal for Jewish communities in the diaspora. It won't. This is our time to stand up and be counted. And if all I managed to achieve in the debate, and I think I could have done better in the debate, there were some zingers I didn't manage to land. But if all I managed to achieve in that debate was to inspire some young Jews to stand up for themselves, for their friends, and for the Jewish people, Dayenu, I've done my job. Elon, in the final minute that we have of this live daily briefing, can you please share a Rosh Hashanah, Shana Tova greeting with all of your listeners around the world? We're going to be back after Rosh Hashanah. We encourage you to continue following on all our social media because there's a lot happening in the news and you'll want to stay updated. What's given me inspiration and hope over the last year is seeing what I call the Great Diaspora Awakening. We've seen Jews around the world and allies as well suddenly get a slap in the face, realize what is at stake, and realize that they need to stand up and be counted. That's given me so much strength and inspiration over the last year. I know it's all of you following the briefings of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office, and we have been reminded of what we're fighting for, and more importantly, who we are fighting for, for each other and for our safety. So my wish for our new year, hopefully it will be sweet, Hopefully it will be good, but it will be a year in which we're all going to be coming together, remembering how much we need each other, how much we love each other, and how determined we are to continue standing up for each other. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for following. We will be back after Rosh Hashanah. In the meanwhile, please follow us on all social media platforms. We'll continue posting content from the Citizen Spokesperson's family to yours. Happy Rosh Hashanah and Chag Sameach, and keep safe.